Lesson 3 from January 8 to 14 The Promised Son Before we start, let's pray. Glory to God in the Most High. We thank you, Lord, for your love and mercy. As we go in to study the lesson for this week, please awaken us in body and spirit with the desire to meet with you and to hear you speak words of affirmation, assurance, and wisdom. Forgive, bless, hear our prayer. In Jesus' name, Amen. Lesson 3 from January 8 to 14 The Promised Son Sabbath Afternoon Read for this week's study, Isaiah 2 verse 2 and 3, Hebrews 1 verse 1 to 4, Exodus 24 verse 16 and 17, Isaiah 44 verse 24, Hebrews 1 verse 10, Luke 1 verse 31 and 32, Hebrews 1 verse 5. Memory text, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and to whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Hebrews 1 verse 2 and 3 Memory text But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and to whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. Hebrews 1 verse 2 and 3 Right after Adam and Eve sinned, God promised them a seed, a son who would deliver them from the enemy, recover the inheritance that had been lost, and fulfill the purpose for which they had been created. Genesis 3 verse 15 This son was both represent and redeem them by taking their place and ultimately by destroying the serpent. When Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfillment. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the deliverer. But the fulfillment of the promise tarried. Ellen G. White, The Desire of Ages, page 31. The promise was later confirmed to Abraham. God swore to him that he would have a seed, a son through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Genesis 22, verse 16 to 18. Galatians 3, verse 16. And God did the same with David. He promised David that his descendant would be installed by God as his own son and would be established as a righteous ruler over all the kings of the earth. 2 Samuel 7 verse 12 to 14 Psalm 89 verse 27 to 29 What neither Adam and Eve, Abraham or David probably never imagined However, was that their Redeemer Son would be God Himself. Sunday, January 9 In these last days, the first paragraph of Hebrews reveals that Paul believed he was living in the last days. Scripture employs two expressions about the future that have different meanings. The prophets use the expression last days or latter days to talk about the future in general. Deuteronomy 4 verse 30 and 31 Jeremiah 23 verse 20 The prophet Daniel used the second expression, the time of the end to talk more specifically about the last days of earth history. Daniel 8 verse 17 Daniel 12 verse 4 Read Numbers 24 verse 14 to 19 and Isaiah 2 verse 2 and 3 
What did God promise he would do for his people in the latter days? Numbers 24 verse 14 to 19 And now indeed I am going to my people. Come, I will advise you what these people will do to your people in the latter days. Balaam's fourth prophecy So he took up his oracle and said, the utterance of Balaam the son of Beor, and the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and batter the brow of Moab, and destroy all the sons of Tumult, and Edom shall be a possession. So also his enemies shall be a possession, while Israel does valiantly. Out of Jacob one shall have dominion and destroy the remains of the city. Isaiah 2 verse 2 Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Isaiah 2 verse 3 Many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Several Old Testament prophets announced that in the latter days, God will raise up a king who would destroy the enemies of his people. Numbers 24 verse 14 to 19 And who would attract the nations to Israel? Isaiah 2 verse 2 and 3 Paul says that these promises were fulfilled in Jesus. He defeated Satan and through the proclamation of the gospel, is attracting all the nations to himself. Colossians 2 verse 15 John 12 verse 32 In this sense then, the last days have begun because Jesus has fulfilled God's promises. Our spiritual fathers died in faith. They saw and greeted the promises from afar, but did not receive them. We, on the other hand, have seen the fulfillment in Jesus. Let's think for a moment about God's promises and Jesus. The Father promised that he would resurrect his children. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 15 and 16 The wonderful news is that he initiated the resurrection of his children with the resurrection of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20 Matthew 27 verse 51 to 53 The Father also promised a new creation. Isaiah 65 verse 17 He has begun to fulfill that promise by creating a new spiritual life in us. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 Galatians 6 verse 15 he promised that he would establish his final kingdom. Daniel 2 verse 44 He inaugurated that kingdom by delivering us from the power of Satan and installing Jesus as our ruler. Matthew 12 verse 28 to 30 Luke 10 verse 18 to 20 This is only the beginning, however. What the Father began to do in Jesus' first coming he will bring to completion at the second. So to finish, look at all the promises God fulfilled in the past. How should this help us to trust him for the promises not yet fulfilled?
Monday, January 10. God has spoken to us by His Son. Read Hebrews 1 verse 1 to 4. What is the central idea of these verses? Hebrews 1 verse 1 to 4. God's supreme revelation. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in this last day spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who be in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. In the original Greek, Hebrews 1 verse 1 to 4 is only one sentence and it has been out that it is the most beautiful in all the New Testament from the point of view of its rhetorical all history. Its main assertion is that God has spoken to us through his son Jesus. For the Jews in the first century AD, the word of God had not been heard for a long time. The last revelation to be expressed in the written word of God had come through the prophet Malachi and the ministries of Israel and Nehemiah four centuries before. But now, through Jesus, God was speaking to them again. God's revelation through Jesus, however, was superior to the revelation that God had made through the prophets because Jesus is a greater means of revelation. He is God himself who created the heavens and the earth and rules the universe. For Paul, the deity of Christ is never in question. It's all but a show. Also for Paul, the Old Testament was the Word of God. The same God who spoke in the past continues to speak in the present. The Old Testament communicated a true knowledge of God's will. However, it was possible to understand its fuller meaning only when the Son arrived on earth. In the other's mind, the Father's revelation in the Son provided the key to understanding the true breath of the Old Testament, just like the picture on the box of a jigsaw puzzle provides the key to finding the correct place for every one of its species. Jesus brought so much of the Old Testament to light. Meanwhile, Jesus came to be our representative and our savior. He would take our place in the fight and defeat the serpent. Similarly, in Hebrews, Jesus is a pioneer, or captain, and forerunner of believers. Hebrews 2 verse 10, Hebrews 6 verse 20. He fights for us and represents us. This also means that what God did for Jesus, our representative, the Father also wants to do for us. He who exalted Jesus at his right hand also wants us to sit with Jesus on his throne. Revelation 3 verse 21 God's message to us in Jesus includes not only what Jesus said, but also what the Father did through him and to him, all for our temporal and internal benefit. So to finish today, Think through what it means that Jesus, God, came to this earth. Why should this truth bring us so much hope? Tuesday, January 11. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Read Hebrews 1 verse 2 to 4. 
What are some of the things that this passage teaches us about Jesus? Hebrews 1 verse 2 to 4 has in this last day spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, to whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the white hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. In this section, we will focus on the portion that says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact import of his nature. Hebrews 1 verse 3 Read Exodus 24 verse 16 and 17 psalm 4 verse 6 psalm 36 verse 9 psalm 89 verse 15 how do these texts help us understand what the glory of god is exodus 24 verse 16 now the glory of the lord rested on mount sinai and the cloud covered it six days and on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Exodus 24 verse 17 The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Psalm 4 verse 6 There are many who say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. Psalm 36 verse 9 For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Psalm 89 verse 15 Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In the Old Testament, the glory of God refers to his visible presence among his people. Exodus 16 verse 7 Exodus 24 verse 16 and 17 Leviticus 9 verse 23 Numbers 14 verse 10 This presence is often associated with light or radiance. Scripture informs us that Jesus is the light who came to this world to reveal the glory of God. Hebrews 1 verse 3 John 1 verse 6 to 9 John 1 verse 14 to 18 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 Think for instance of how Jesus appeared in the transfiguration and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Matthew 17 verse 2 Just as the sun cannot be perceived except by the radiance of its light, God is known through Jesus. From our perspective, the two are one. Because God's glory is light itself, there is no difference in actual being and character between God and Jesus just as there is no difference between light and its radiance. Hebrews also says that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father's substance. Hebrews 1 verse 3 The point of the metaphor is that there is a perfect correspondence in being or essence between the Father and the Son. Note that human beings carry God's image but not His essence. Genesis 1 verse 26 The Son, whoever, shares the same essence with the Father. No wonder that Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. John 14 verse 9 
So to finish, why is that such great news that Jesus reveals the character and the glory of the Father to us? What does Jesus tell us about what the Father is like? Wednesday, January 12 To whom he made the universe Hebrews affirms that God created the world through or by Jesus and that Jesus sustains the world with his powerful word. Read Isaiah 44 verse 24, Isaiah 45 verse 18, and Nehemiah 9 verse 6. Because in the Old Testament the Lord affirmed that he created the world alone and that he is the only God. How can we reconcile this affirmation with the affirmations in the New Testament that God created the universe through Jesus? Hebrews 1 verse 2 and 3 Isaiah 44 verse 24 Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. Isaiah 45 verse 18 For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited, I am the Lord and there is no other. Jeremiah 9 verse 6 You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. Some think that Jesus was merely the instrument through whom God created. This is not possible. First, for Paul, Jesus is the Lord who created the world. He was not a helper. Hebrews 1 verse 10 says that Jesus is the Lord who created the earth and the heavens. And Paul also applies to him what Psalm 102 verse 25 to 27 says about the Lord as creator. Second, Hebrews 2 verse 10 says that the universe was created by or through the Father. Exactly the same expressions that are applied to Jesus in Hebrews 1 verse 2. The Father created and Jesus created. Hebrews 1 verse 2, Hebrews 1 verse 10, Hebrews 2 verse 10. There is a perfect agreement between Father and Son in purpose and activity. This is part of the mystery of the Trinity. Jesus created and God created, but there is only one Creator, God, which implies that Jesus is God. Meanwhile, Hebrews 4 verse 13 shows that Jesus is also judge. His authority to rule and judge derives from the fact that God created all things and sustained the universe. Isaiah 44 verse 24 to 28 Hebrews 1 verse 3 and Colossians 1 verse 17 affirm that Jesus also sustains the universe. This sustaining action probably includes the idea of guidance or governance. The Greek word free one, sustaining, carrying is used to describe the wind driving a boat. Acts 27 verse 15 and 17 Or God leading the prophets. 2 Peter 1 verse 21 Thus, in a real sense, Jesus not only created us but sustained us as well. Every breath, every heartbeat, Every moment of our existence is found in Him, Jesus, the foundation of all created existence. 
Look up Acts 17 verse 28 and we read, For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, For we are also his offspring. So to finish, what does it say to us about Jesus and his power? Then think about the implications of this same Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. What does the truth teach us about the self-denying character of our Lord? Thursday, January 13 Today I have begotten you. Hebrews 1 verse 5 reports the following words of the Father to Jesus. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. What does it mean that Jesus was begotten? And when did this happen? Does not this show that Jesus was somehow created by God sometime way in the past, as many believe? Read Hebrews 1 verse 5, 2 Samuel 7 verse 12 to 14, Psalm 2 verse 7, and Luke 1 verse 31 and 32. What promise to David did Paul in Hebrews apply to Jesus? Hebrews 1 verse 5, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son? Today I have begotten you, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. 2 Samuel 7 verse 12 to 14 When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the son of man. Psalm 2 verse 7 I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Luke 1 verse 31 And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Luke 1 verse 32 He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Jesus was begotten in the sense that he was installed or adopted by God as the promised ruler, the son of David. The concept of the divine adoption of the ruler was common in the Greek or Roman world in the East. It gave the ruler legitimacy and power over the land. God promised to David, however, that his son would be the true legitimate ruler of the nations. He would adopt David's son as his own son. Through this process, the David the king would become God's protege and his heir. The covenant is fulfilled in Jesus as the son of David. God would defeat his enemies and give him the nations as his inheritance. Psalm 89 verse 27, Psalm 2 verse 7 and 8. As we can read in Romans 1 verse 3 and 4, and Acts 13 verse 32 and 33, Jesus was publicly revealed as God's Son. Jesus' baptism and transfiguration were moments when God identified and announced Jesus as His Son. Matthew 3 verse 17, Matthew 17 verse 5. Yet, according to the New Testament, 
Jesus became the Son of God with power when he was resurrected and seated at the right hand of God. It was at that moment that God fulfilled his promise to David that his son would be adopted as God's son and his throne over the nations would be established forever. 2 Samuel 7 verse 12 to 14 Thus, Caesar, symbol of Rome, was not the legitimate son of God, ruler of the nations. Instead, Jesus Christ was. The beginning of Jesus refers to the beginning of Jesus' rule over the nations, and not to the beginning of his existence, because Jesus had always existed. There was never a time when Jesus did not exist because he is God. In fact, Hebrews 7 verse 3 says that Jesus does not have beginning of days nor end of life. Hebrews 13 verse 8 Because he is eternal. Thus, the idea of Jesus as God's only begotten Son is not dealing with the nature of Christ as deity but with his role in the plan of salvation. Through the Incarnation, Christ fulfilled all the covenant promises. Friday, January 14 Further Thought The coming of Jesus to this earth as the Son of God fulfilled several functions at the same time. In the first place, as the divine Son of God, Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. Through his actions and words, Jesus showed us what the Father really is like and why we could trust and obey him. Jesus also came as the promised Son of David, Abraham, and Adam through whom God had promised he would defeat the enemy and rule the world. Thus, Jesus came to take the place of Adam at the head of humanity and fulfill the original purpose God had for them. Genesis 1 verse 26 to 28 Psalm 8 verse 3 to 8 Jesus came to be the righteous ruler God always wanted this world to have. The word that was spoken to Jesus at the Jordan, This is my bill of son, in whom I am well pleased, embraces humanity. God spoke to Jesus as our representative. With all our sins and weaknesses, we are not cast aside as worthless. He had made us accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1 verse 6 The glory that rested upon Christ is a pledge of the love of God for us. The light which fell from the open portals upon the head of our Savior will fall upon us as we pray for help to resist temptation. The voice which spoke to Jesus says to every believing soul, This is my beloved child, in whom I am well pleased. Ellen G. White, The Desire of Ages, page 113 Discussion Questions We have learned that a better understanding of Jesus' words and actions helps us understand God the Father better. In what practical ways should a better understanding of Jesus enrich your relationship with God the Father? We learn that the way God spoke to and treated Jesus is the way he wants to speak to and treat us. What should that tell us about how we should treat others? Dwell on the importance of the eternal deity of Christ. What is lost if we believe that Jesus was somehow, in some way, a created being like us, but who went to the cross? Contrast that thought with the reality that Christ was eternal God, and he himself went to the cross. 
what is the big difference between the two ideas in class talk about giving glory to god read revelation 14 verse 7 how is giving glory to god part of the present truth and the three angels messages